after that, we're going to have a brief discussion amongst the panel and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. So, a great question. Happy you guys are all here. All right. On January 31st of 2020, the WHO officially declared the novel coronavirus a public health emergency. In the past week, the novel coronavirus has seen a boom in Italy, South Korea, and Iran in unrelenting global spread. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte that's right, has banned people from leaving infected areas, and police have been ordered to find anyone caught entering or leaving certain towns. Several cruise ships carrying those sick with the virus have been turned away at ports by countries who choose to isolate themselves. Today, today, the Iranian Deputy Health Minister and head of Iran's Coronavirus Task Force, who downplayed the threat of the virus, uh, based on how many people had it in Iran, has contracted it. So, it's not good. Chinese President Xi Jinping has said that, quote, all out efforts must be made in the prevention and control of contagion, and called on, quote, party committees and governments at various levels, as well as relevant departments, to make people's lives and health a top priority, devise meticulous plans, mobilize all available resources, and take concrete and effective measures to contain further spread of sickness. Chinese authorities also shared the genetic sequence of the 2019 NCOV, novel coronavirus, early in January to support the diagnosis of potential patients around the world, as well as aid the creation of vaccines against the novel virus. In this interdisciplinary panel, we want to try and explore the response at the national and international level to the novel coronavirus, which is quickly evolving into a global threat. We also want to explore how infectious disease outbreaks differ in important ways that make it especially difficult to establish a set of governmental best practices. So here is our panel on my left. We have Susan Childers. Hello. <laughs> Susan Childers worked in the, works in the biology department at Colby, and her teaching includes a new course last fall exploring ways that infectious diseases and health are impacted by climate change. She also leads a geomedicine-themed seminar exploring links between geological processes and human health. Her research interests include the physi physiology of microbes that were likely present on early Earth and present-day bacteria that interact with metals and metalloids. She holds a PhD in microbiology. On my right is Laura C. Laura C. is an assistant professor of government at Colby College, where she teaches courses on African politics, conflict, and development. Her research and commentary have appeared in numerous peer-reviewed and popular publications, including the review of African political economy, foreign affairs, and the Atlantic. She is also an editor for Af Africa content at the Monkey Cage, the political science blog of the Washington Post, and she has a PhD in government. She's also an IR professor. <laughs> on my left again is Walter Hatch. Hello. Walter Hatch is an expert on Asian politics as well as comparative political economy and global security. His research focus is on politics and economy in Japan, Japan US, and Japan Asia relations, uh, comparative regionalism and regionalization, and of Chinese civil society. Academia is his second career. He spent years as a journalist, mostly as a political and investigative reporter for the Seattle Times, but also as a stringer for CBS News. He holds a PhD in political economy. On my right again is Gail Carlson. Gail Carlson teaches environmental public health courses in the EES program uh, here at Colby and is the director of the Buck Lab for Climate and Environment. She conducts research with students on environmental contamination, safer ch chemical policies, and food security in Maine. She's a frequent expert witness for environmental policy making in Maine, and she has a PhD in biochemistry. So that is our panel today. Um, so we're just going to open it up more specifically, focusing on the coronavirus uh, and its recent updates and how it's kind of grown at the global level. Uh, and then we're going to hopefully try and broaden it out to lessons you can learn about infectious diseases and government and global response. Um, so one of the things that I think would be really helpful to kick this off with is, is, at least within your own field, what is something that you've seen that's really unique about the novel coronavirus's growth? Um, and I guess what isn't? You know, there are certain things that we can definitely tell are, are propping up because of issues that have led to things like this before. I know, at least in China, uh, Professor Hatch, there were certain focuses on the way that it was handled early on that is, is no surprise to how it was able to snowball as quickly as it did. Um, but also, we look at things like the WHO on the global scale, and that response was maybe not as effective as some people uh, would have hoped it had been. So I guess we can start probably on the far right. Uh, do you want to open up on this one? 
Um, so do you want us to talk about what we're seeing that's <coughs> novel about this, or just generally what it is? Do you want to start with what it is? Or? Sure, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> okay, so if we take a step back and we just think about what this is and how we got here, um, there are some important comparisons and contrasts between this virus and this disease and others that are important to point out and that um, have both um, improved the response of, say, countries or the WHO compared to past outbreaks, um, but have also um, sort of uh, created confusion and led to maybe perhaps some degree of inadequate uh, response. So the virus is a coronavirus, and other coronaviri uh, include SARS, which you may have heard of, um, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was an outbreak in China, and MERS, which is a Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome. Those are both coronaviruses. Um, one of which is contained, was, was contained fairly rapidly, SARS, and um, had about a little over 8,000 cases and 774 deaths with a very high case fatality rate. That means the people who get the virus, how many people, what percentage of the people who get the virus die from that infection. And MERS is ongoing, but only has about 2,500 confirmed cases. So, um, you know, as of today, you can find out what the current coronavirus data are by looking at what's called the WHO situation <coughs> report. And you can just get that online. And the latest numbers are now over 80,000 confirmed cases, 97% in China, and um, over to about 2,700 deaths, 99% um, percent in China. So even just looking at the numbers, of course, it's a huge, um, it's a very, very different uh, situation. The response, and others can talk more about the country level response, but the response of first China, where the, obviously in Wuhan was, was where the virus outbreak occurred, the response may have seemed slow, and indeed it was several weeks between the first report of the virus and um, the China reporting it, um, but uh, those that three week difference is very different than the four months that it took for them to acknowledge SARS. Um, and then it was after China reported it, um, around the 1st of January this year, within a few days they had reported the viral genome, which was quite rapid, and that is really important for diagnostic and vaccine, <coughs> vaccine purposes. And um, that it was the end of the month, as um, Josh mentioned, that the World Health Organization um, issued the um, you know, public health um, emergency declaration, which is really their highest, um, their highest alert um, and signals to the world, importantly, that, um, you know, that everybody needs to take it seriously and also um, kind of uh, empowers the WHO to uh, be able to take certain actions and make certain recommendations. Um, so it's actually uh, an important uh, designation. It's not the same as a pandemic designation, which the WHO has yet to make for this particular disease, but it is like the highest level of sort of official designation, public health emergency of international concern. Um, so, um, so far the case fatality rate for this is two to four percent in Wuhan, um, which different, which is much lower than for SARS and MERS, and much lower in other parts of the world. So, I guess I'll leave it at that and see what other people want to add. Uh, so I guess, here we go. Uh, at least on the international organization level, when we look at the WHO's response, what, what do you think? At least, I know some people have looked critically at it based on how quickly it was. And yeah, so I, I think the WHO is always in an impossible spot on these things because on the one hand, there's a lot of a lot of uh, sort of backseat drivers or Monday morning quarterbacking about why didn't you do this at this point. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of the WHO for um, its officials praising China's response. You know, people say if, if, if China had done such a good job, the situation wouldn't be as bad as it was if they hadn't hidden it for the first three weeks. It wouldn't be better, but, but the alternative to that is what? Is to criticize China? Um, which seems like a really good, and Walter would know more about this than me, but that seems like a really good way to, to get less cooperation um, with the Chinese authorities, less access to accurate and up-to-date information on, on what we know and what we don't know about what's going on. Um, so I think the WHO is, 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 kind of has to walk this delicate line of 
um, representing the, the interests of you know, kind of global best practices in global health um, and the interest of its member of the member states of the United Nations. It is a UN agency um, with maintaining relationships with the countries where the outbreak is ongoing um, so as to keep lines of communication open. Um, they're also dealing with a lot of reactions from different states that, that go against um, you know, kind of global public health best practices. So for example, shutting down airline routes to, to all of China or you know, every route from your country to China um, is not a recommended course of action. It, is, um, it, it induces panic, it induces fear, it makes people um, feel like they're at more of a risk than they actually are at this point from, from the virus. But it also impedes the movement of public health workers and uh, more importantly of emergency supplies to the areas where the outbreak is. And if you want to contain an outbreak, the last thing you want to do is cut off access. Um, so I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on coronaviruses at all, um, but I've done a lot of work on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 and 15, and there's an ongoing Ebola outbreak in the Eastern Congo right now. Um, and in both of those, or especially in the, one of the lessons we learned from the West Africa situation five years ago was that canceling all the flights probably actually made things worse. Um, because it made it so much harder to get public health workers in and out, so much harder to get personal protective equipment and all the other supplies that you need um, to, to manage a situation like this. So, you know, I think right now the criticism that I'm seeing at the WHO this week is why haven't they called it a pandemic yet? Um, pandemic is a technical term um, and it has meaning. It can't just be we're scared of this and it's happened in a few countries and therefore it's a pandemic. Um, I believe that Gail would probably know better than me, but the, the, the technical definition of a pandemic is that it is having like a significant impact on at least two continents. Um, and so far, thankfully, we do not see that. Um, yeah, 300 cases in Italy is scary. Um, however many cases in Iran, I doubt the official count is the actual count in Iran, quite frankly, but um, that, that's, that's not good, obviously, but it is nowhere near what the situation in Wuhan is. And, and we should be grateful for that. Um, are the odds that it'll become a pandemic? Some people say yes, some people say no. I think it's hard to tell at this point. Um, but the WHO doesn't want to induce panic, and that's why they take their time, make sure that certain benchmarks have been met. Um, they were being criticized in late January for not having declared it a public health emergency of global concern yet. Um, but again, they were trying to gather data and, and trying to, to get the facts. So I, I kind of, I, I have a lot of um, sympathy for the leaders of the WHO because I think they're gonna get criticized no matter what they say. Um, I saw something yesterday, um, the, the WHO has had a group of experts in China um, over the past few days looking into the situation, and one of the things that was announced at this press conference yesterday was that there has been a 70% reduction in the number of new cases per day, uh, which is still a lot of people, I think it's 400 something new cases per day, but it's, it's falling. And immediately, you know, the, the Twitter's instant global public health experts um, are declaring, well, you, does he speak Chinese? Did, you know, did they just take the data that they were given? Um, that is not a way to build trust between international organizations and member states. Um, and, you know, there, there's a the question of like, to what, what reason would China misreport data? They may have, have political reasons for doing that. I, I'm not an expert on China, but at the same time, they seem to be very serious about containing and stopping this outbreak and have been cooperating with the World Health Organization. So it seems a bit of a leap to just assume that they would falsify information um, at this stage. So yeah, I think they're kind of between a rock and a hard place, quite frankly. Okay. Yeah, and I will add on this idea of pandemic, again, that does promote fear. People hear that and they just think, oh my God, you know, I gotta get away. But it's technically, you know, so a pandemic is not only about how quickly something spreads, it's also, the severity of the virus and the lethality, right, the mortality rate. And this is a relatively low mortality rate disease with a high transmission rate. So we're getting a lot of people infected, but the, the death, and again, the population, the elderly population is at mortality rates higher, but, and you take the average, two to four percent, you know, three percent is what I've seen lately, um, compared to SARS-1, which was 10%, you know, MERS was more like 35% or something, Ebola is closer to 50%. Those are um, diseases that you really want to say, okay, we've got to put the alert out. This one, I think, you know, overall, uh, maybe China was a little late in what they did, but, but 
that's one of the first things you do. When you don't know about a disease, you try and contain it, right? The first thing you need to do, because you gotta learn more about it, you don't know how it's transmits, you don't know how fast it's transmits, and you don't know how deadly it is. And so I think um, what they've done has been at least a good step. Again, sooner, don't know how that would have mattered, and part of that is why we're not seeing a rapid global spread. Yes, we're seeing outbreaks, right? in Iran and Italy, and there will be more of those because part of our learning process is understanding, okay, how are those outbreaks starting? Where are they coming from, right? It's not somebody directly tied or who has been to Wuhan or the province, you know, so how is it that those starter infectious people in these regions, you know, are, are spreading? And again, at the, the state, country level, when you recognize it's happening, containing it, you know, so the information is out there. I know in the U.S., we, the C, um, CDC, put uh, together basically preparing communities. They've already stepped up the efforts to prepare communities, get people out there, workers out there, educate the community on what do you do if you think you have someone who might have um, the disease, you know, how do you prepare that particular region so you don't get spread. So um, I think, you know, the who is in a tough position, right? The World Health Organization, but um, but right, their their I suppose goal of not trying to spread global fear, which is happening anyway, at least in pockets. The other thing I would add to this is um, this virus is essentially SARS-2. It's a variant of SARS from from the uh, early 2000s. It's very closely related. It's not going to be the last one. Right. This is not something that's going to go away. These viruses are common in, in bats. Um, they intermingle. There's genetic recombination. So new strains are being made all the time. It's the same as influenza, right? We have more issues with the influenza, the flu, right now, at least in the U.S. That's our concern. I mean, there's something like, um, I, don't know, I wrote somewhere in my notes in terms of transmissibility and how many cases. There's something like, um, 26 million cases or illnesses with 14,000 deaths, which again is 0.1% mortality, so very, very low, but a lot more cases. And um, same thing happens in terms of the agent, right? When you understand more about rearrangement, maybe we can't predict what's coming next year. And this year so far, the influenza strain has changed a little bit, but you know, getting back to coronavirus, same thing. We can't predict when the next one's going to come out. We just know it will. You know, one of our biggest fears is the avian flu, right, which is a, an influenza. I think that's a lot of concern because the influenza viruses tend to be more deadly. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I think, you know, at least in the U.S. being prepared, how China at, at least handled it once they, they recognize this is going to be bad, um, you know, but, but there's still going to be kind of things coming off of that that may not be the best in terms of travel bans, how do you get public health workers in when you are trying to contain the spread of the disease? Sure. So people have been asking me, why do these things seem to keep happening in China? Um, SARS, of course, in 2002-03, this uh, crisis now. And um, I've been reading what strike me as um, somewhat bizarre, even perhaps racist uh, arguments about uh, the eating of wild animals as though, you know, we don't do the same thing eating wild animals in the United States. Um, and maybe it's just because I'm a political scientist and you know that expression about, you know, uh, if you, the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, for me, I always look at uh, political systems, and I think um, the story of Dr. Lee, the ophthalmologist who just died a few weeks ago, he was one of the first in, in <coughs> to, um, maybe the first to actually report or post publicly about uh, this new um, scary, uh, virus that seemed to be appearing. And um, he was quickly visited by a couple of officials who forced him to write a statement saying that he had falsely um, uh, made this claim. Um, 
And although, Gail, you're right that uh, the Chinese government was uh, much quicker to take action in this case than in the case of SARS, I, I think there's a similarity. I think there's a, um, a problem in center local relations, government relations, in what I would call a sort of decentralized authoritarian system. Uh, in China, you know, it's a huge country of almost 1.4 billion people, uh, very diverse in, in many ways. Um, so the government of Beijing has delegated a lot of responsibility to uh, local authorities at the provincial, township, village level. Um, but it's not a federal system, right? It's a unitary system. The government in Beijing wants to maintain control. They are the ones that set the policies. Local governments are supposed to implement those policies. And, um, because of the way that they use carrots and sticks at the central government level to try to um, get local authorities to follow through, there's a lot of what I call information hoarding. Uh, or um, information uh, control that local governments uh, engage in to uh, try to protect themselves, to be able to win promotions. Uh, that's the carrot part. Um, and also in order to avoid punishment. Um, you know, they don't want to screw up. So uh, if there's a public health crisis, um, they want to keep that information um, from getting out if it's going to lead to uh, problems for local government officials. So I think it's in part, not entirely, a problem of um, a political system um, uh, that is not a federal system, that is not saying that federal systems are the only or best way, you know, Canada, Mexico, the United States all have a federal system, but um, there's a kind of information impactedness or information hoarding that naturally happens in a system constructed this way um, where local authorities are expected to carry out uh, the responsibilities of the center um, at the risk of punishment um, or um, at, at the cost of not getting promotions. Um, and I think we've seen it in other things besides public health problems, right? The, um, I guess this is a public health problem. In 2008, um, uh, milk was found to be contaminated uh, with a toxic chemical in China uh, that um, uh, dairy producers were using in order to um, sell more milk and children were getting sick and dying. And to me, that was another case where local government officials um, uh, because of this uh, system of incentives and disincentives, um, chose to uh, conceal, uh, to hoard the information about what was happening. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think one of the things I want to get to right now that, that is especially prevalent today, even, uh, if, if any of you have the news out on your phone, one of the big, the big the notifications that really kind of shook everyone was uh, the CDC, I think, officially announced either today or yesterday um, that it was inevitable that the coronavirus was going to become something that we were going to have to deal with within the U.S. Um, and the stock market. Yeah. <coughs> dramatically yeah. today because of that. Yeah. That was, that was brutal. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting to look at from just a national perspective is, is knowing that something's going to inevitably touch down like this, how, how can you best prepare for what's going to happen. We talked about this a little bit in terms of kind of taking the right precautions, and you spoke about how shutting down ports can be kind of a, a really ineffective solution. Um, but, but what are next steps for at least the CDC or the US? How do you both coordinate nationally and with, with an international organization like the WHO to really give yourself the best options? I guess if you want to. Yeah, I, I think um, we're really in a serious situation right now, and that's because. Um, the priorities of the current administration have been to cut many of the preparedness activities um, and budgets that, that are intended for just this kind of situation. So um, after the Ebola crisis, or actually during the Ebola crisis, um, there was a realization in the United States government that we did not have a point person whose job it was to handle responses to global health crises. 
Um, and so in response to that, you know, just one person who knows what everyone in every agency that's relevant to, to the crisis in West Africa at the time uh, knew what was going on and could make decisions. Um, so you have the State Department, you have the Defense Department, you have the CDC, you have all these different actors involved, um, and there was a need for a coordinator. Um, and so they created something called um, the Office of Global Health Security um, as part of the National Security Council staff. Um, so the person who is the director of that office, the political appointee, serves at the pleasure of the president, um, is supposed to be the point person. So that um, office existed from 2015 to 2018. Um, the first two years of the Trump administration stayed intact, um, but when John Bolton became the national security advisor in 2018, one of his priorities was cutting the size of the NSC staff, and so this was one of the positions that was cut. Uh, so we right now do not have a person whose job it is to, to coordinate a national response to a public health crisis of this sort. Of course, the Center for Disease Control um, has people whose, whose job this is, um, but the administration has cut the budget of the CDC over the last couple of years by about 10%, as I understand it, and some of those cuts have come in the area of preparedness uh, for a particular crisis like this. So I think this is this is you know has the potential to be a real moment of reckoning um, about what is necessary. It costs money to respond to a crisis, um, and it costs money to respond to it out of your country um, and to, to try to keep it you know from affecting your country too badly. Uh, but when it happens in your country, and it is true, it is almost inevitable that, that it will be here. Um, it, it is going to cost a lot of money, and there is a need for a coordinated response. Um, if it's going to be done effectively. You know, I, I think Walter's right, there are a lot of advantages to federal system, um, but there are some disadvantages too, and, and not having that, that central point person so that you know, we don't have a wildly different policy in South Carolina and North Carolina, for example, um, is, is going to be really important. Um, in terms of getting ready for it, you know, I think um, information sharing, both about um, who's infected, what the, what the results of their cases are, how we're treating them, what we are finding to be effective and not effective in treatment um, is, is really important. Um, and, and the WHO is one of the good mechanisms for that. Um, there's also the question of scientific research, which I will not speak to the, the type of scientific research, but there, you know, scientific scientists are doing research right now. Um, a lot of our models for um, publishing in academia um, are set up around articles that get put behind gated paywalls and very slow publication processes to get results out. Um, and so that means that some researchers working on this face a competing set of incentives, right? If, if I'm an assistant professor um, trying to figure out you know, how this is transmitted, say, um, what are some of the possible means of transmission, and I come up with a really interesting finding on that, do I put it out there because it's in the interest of the public good to put it out there so that people working on it you know, we hope that people would do that, or, but that means that I might risk not having my academic publication that I need to get tenure. Um, and at, at some universities that, you know, that, that's make or break type stuff. Um, so I think, you know, finding ways to ensure that information is available as soon as possible, um, wh whether that's preprints, online, whatever, um, making sure that the incentives are all aligned so that the information can be shared, um, whether it's from research or, you know, hard data about what's going on. All of that is going to be really, really important moving forward. Sure. I can say something about the research. There have been several descriptive, descriptive epidemiology studies published um, on the first set of cases. So maybe it's looking at an N of 100 or something, but at least it's giving um, us a sense of, at least in the early days of the outbreak in Wuhan, what the epidemiology looks like, who was infected, what are the you know, characteristics of those people, how did transmission come about, um, and some of those things. So that's um, been very important, and it's one of the pillars of responses to these things is to do both basic and clinical research. Um, and um, China is doing that work. Uh, the WHO coordinates a lot of that, and this US CDC and the US National Institutes of Health actually play an uh, outsized role globally, um, and they're very involved in that as well. Another important aspect of research, which is ongoing and would be important for a U.S. and a, if there were in this inevitable, um, uncontrolled outbreak in the U.S., is um, research into diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. 
And you may have seen a lot of information about this um, in most of the major infectious disease outbreaks that happened over the last 20 years. Um, work was done largely um, in, in uh, partnership and collaboration with the National Institutes of Health in the United States to develop uh, vaccines, which takes a long time. Basic research advanced, but in every case, there was no vaccine ready in time to really be effective um, for you know that particular disease. But it does advance you know our ability to create kind of platforms that you could then use to you know for for um, vaccine development for the next disease or whatever. You may have seen some um, different stories in the media. Um, including things from the president that were false, but uh, at the very, very earliest, um, there could be uh, a vaccine in something like 18 months. But that would, and that includes the time it takes for all the trials and just scientific advances, but that also includes, that, that's absolutely aspirational. That includes the time and the cost involved in scaling up and production and distribution as well. So. Um, it's a lot of you know a lot of work is going into it as it has for the other diseases, but it's um, you know by no means a perfect um, approach. And then the other thing that's happening is you're seeing research groups, um, including in clinical settings, sort of laying out the arsenal of possible therapeutics, possible drugs that have been used against other viruses, and just trying them out and seeing if they're effective in this particular case. So all of that stuff would, is benefiting the world. Um, and would and will benefit um, what's happening in, happening in the United States um, as well as far as what the United States ought to be doing. It, it really is a, um, you know, a combination of what we've already talked about. You need to be, figure out how to contain the spread of the disease and then the preparedness that Susan was talking about, um, which includes things like things at the community level or being able to, the C CDC was talking today about preparing for things like teleschooling, so what happens if people are end up being in lockdown in different situations? How would they, how would kids go to school or how would people get to work? And um, you know, so it's, it's quite a wide range of responses that pr would prepare a community, um, so. Okay, um, so I think talking about the global approach and how, how individual nations are able to kind of work together towards Kind of uh, pooling resources and being able to work on a global scale is, is, can be especially effective. But at least I was speaking with, with you about this earlier. One of the things that we've seen recently was, uh, at least in Iran, I think it was the case that they had sent uh, something like 10,000 face masks. Two million. Two million face masks, <laughs> way off, um, <laughs> over to China. And that was before they were seriously hit. Uh, and now they are running into some serious problems uh, domestically with, with that kind of international cooperation. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if either Bill or anybody wants to really uh, answer this. Uh, where do you kind of draw the line between national kind of defense and isolation and international cooperation? Anybody wants to go for it? All right. <laughs> um, <so>. Thanks, Walter. <laughs> Where do you draw the line between defending yourselves and, and cooperating? Um, I think that's a really difficult question to ask because is there such a distinction anymore in a globalized era where people, information, goods and services are constantly moving back and forth um, across borders? Um, you know, I am not sure that that distinction, I think that it's a bit of a false dichotomy, even though I understand what motivates it. Um, yeah, Iran appears to be in trouble. They, they made a decision early on to keep their flights running, uh, which of course now is, is the basis for a lot of criticism. Um, and they decided they, they want to maintain a good relationship with China, so they were shipping aid, um, including this gift of, of face masks. Um, and you know, I think the temptation is to say, well, those are really foolish choices. Um, not necessarily, right? Those are in line with, with kind of best practice type stuff, but uh, the problem is that the Iranian state um, is not as strong in its public health capacity as, as other states might be. So for a country like the United States, which you know, I, I do think our institutions are in some political trouble right now, but, but we, we still have pretty strong institutions. We have a Center for Disease Control um, that, that has a budget and is quite effective at what it does. 
Um, we have lots of people who are experts on these all the kinds of things Gail has been talking about um, with the capability to do that. And, and the challenge is when this hits in countries that do not have those capacities. I think for them, the question is, you know, it, it, it is going to look a lot more rational to seal off your borders and stop letting people come in and out um, because the, the potential consequences of an outbreak could be, could be much, much more severe. Um, at the same time, can those countries afford to uh, break the relationship with China? So I'm thinking about East Africa, a region that I know really well, um, you know, where Chinese investments uh, make a huge um, difference in, in the way that the economy functions. And from particular goods and services that are sold to the movement of people back and forth between the two places, saying we're gonna shut that down because we're afraid of something that might happen uh, is probably a non-starter and probably causes longer term diplomatic and economic harm than simply the duration of, of the virus. So I don't think there's a great answer, but Walter, I think, wants to Well, I'm just thinking in. about um, the notion of, of sealing off a community. Um, I mean, that's kind of what the uh, Japanese government did with that cruise ship uh, with how many thousands of passengers who were essentially uh, left in their cabins um, after having infected one another at buffet lines and, and so on. Um, that was just a, an amazingly bungled operation where people had no chance to get out. Um, I think the, the quote in the New York Times article was half that it became a kind of petri dish for um, spread of the virus within that sealed off community. So I'm, you know, obviously a nation isn't a cruise ship, but um, <laughs> we, we can, I think we, we can go a little bit too far in this idea of being able to seal ourselves off and protect ourselves from this. Mm -hmm. So at least from a scientific per uh, perspective for Dr. Carlson and Charles, um, what can you really do and, and how, how much has this kind of globalized effort really affected the, the impact of the virus spreading within these nations that choose to really cooperate and they're going to take in the, the people that choose to take in the passengers of these cruise ships and really put themselves out there as, as charitable and willing to take on the virus head on? I, I think that depends on you know, how far they're willing to go when they take it, knowing that there's a percentage that are probably going to be infected, maybe not showing signs, but but it's almost as, it's like, okay, we're going to take your passengers off your ship, and then, uh, but we're going to keep you isolated here, right? So, but at least on land, you would have access to medical help that you're not going to have on a cruise ship, so, um, you know, like, but some, like, it depends country to country, some countries can't do that. That's what we're saying. They don't have the, the infrastructure to be able to do that. And so as much as they may want to, it's not a good idea. And so, yeah, they're going to behave like Japan and say, okay, no, stay away. I, I heard early on, and I don't know if this is true or not, but there was talk, I think it was Australia, they wanted to drop off some people, put them on an island first before coming to the mainland. And there was some discussion. I don't know what happened beyond that. Maybe you know, the other ones do. But um, yeah, I, I think it's kind of dependent. Sure. Um, finances. Well, one of the interesting things about looking at the situation report is this they have this bar graph that shows the <coughs> origins of all of the cases outside of China. Mm -hmm. And so the attributing cases to China has, has now is gone as of February 14th. And all of the new cases that are reported or where symptoms are seen, um, there is one, you know, international conveyance is one category, which is basically cruise ships. But there are, mo you know, the, as that wanes now, as the Diamond Princess um, situation is over, you know, the, the, the scary color is the green color, which is the country that the case is in, was where the case originated. So I think we have to think, you know, and, and you're seeing um, these little towns in uh, Lombardy in northern Italy now yeah. um, under lockdown and nobody can go in and out. So they're in a sense kind of like a mini cruise ship um, 
And, you know, again, that's, I think the CDC is also thinking about whether or not that could actually be something that would, you know, that could uh, happen in the U.S. I think pretty much, I think public health people pretty much are not in favor of the idea of self-preservation or lockdown um, because of the things that Laura's talked about, how we don't have free flow of information, free flow of health professionals, free flow of um, equipment, um, you know, and things like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, again, I mean, I misread this, but isn't there, I thought I saw the other day something about, don't they want to move, like, the cases to California, one city, California mm -hmm. cases? Judge blocked it. Yeah, yeah, right, and then there was some controversy over that because they wanted to put everybody in one general area, which was going to transport of people, infectious people. There's also the question of managing panic, right, though, mm -hmm. which yep. one way to manage panic is to say, don't worry, we've sealed it off. Like, yep. they're all right. there. Um, you know, if you remember, I don't, I don't know if you all would remember, but in, during the Ebola outbreak, there was a nurse yep. who's from Northern Maine, like from Fort Kent, right. and who had been treating Ebola patients in West Africa. You know, you had all these doctors and nurses who were volunteering to go. She was perfectly fine. She did not have Ebola. And the government tried to put her in isolation. She sued over it. Um, and the, the compromise they came up with was like she was going to be under kind of home quarantine. I, I don't think we can call it self-quarantine because she definitely was doing it under protest. Um, but you know, it was, it was in every scientific respect ridiculous to have her in quarantine. There was, there was no scientific reason to do that. But politicians were the ones making those decisions, not, science, not scientists. And the politicians were making those decisions to try to promote calm, to try to not have panic in communities or you know, set off where everybody who was in Newark Airport on the night of July 15th is gonna freak out. Um, you know, there, there is a, there's some difficult questions there um, about personal liberty and managing fear and panic that um, I don't know that we have great answers or preparedness for. And every disease, you know, potentially is different, especially in terms of transmission, so it's harder to yeah, um, yeah. You know, generalize. So we could ask the same questions about Colby's decisions, right? Like, like, the, the choices that Colby made. I, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know how that decision was made. But you know, who, for whom is that decision made? Is it about panic and fear in the community? Which certainly, when some news got leaked out and was inaccurately reported, there was there was some freaking out that went on on a local news station that, that was completely unnecessary. Um, how do you, what are the right choices to manage? I don't, I don't think we have great answers. And this is an evolving yeah. situation yeah. Um, and a novel situation and a novel virus. So I think a lot of the decisions that have been made, um, you know, were made, as you said, for many different reasons. You know, decision makers and even scientists and public health officials and local and national and international officials make decisions for many, many different reasons. With imperfect information, yeah, and it's all been imperfect information, and we still are saying that because we haven't called it a pandemic yet. We can't nail down is there really, you know, worldwide spread of this disease. Um, you know, it's, today there were four more countries reported that had um, the disease, so it's likely moving in that direction. But the U.S. is also can't say whether or not, you know, it's going to be a problem here. It, people, you know, so CDC direct, people are saying like it probably will, but we have very imperfect information. So. What's the story with uh, Italy, northern Italy? Why, why did it spread so quickly? What, or <coughs> why has that become such a problem? Now? So disease, uh, case one, not case zero, they don't know who case zero was, but case one was treated in a hospital and um, the proper procedures were not followed and okay. that person infected other people in the hospital. Okay. Um, and the, I haven't seen any more details than that. But that's not inconsistent with what happened with SARS, which is a related virus, but actually had some was, was different in terms of transmission. But um, with SARS, uh, people were most infectious when they were already sick, and therefore they were already in the hospital. And so almost all of the spread from person to person in, with SARS was actually in the hospital, which was, which was beneficial because you could actually get it under control because it was already in a setting like a hospital that had professionals there. Whereas, you know, by the time um, the world recognized this coronavirus, there were already thousands of infected people. Um, so I think it was kind of a unique situation. Um, 
But it's interesting how many of these outbreaks um, in various parts of the world, or even what happened in Wuhan, have, have had these kind of singular, you know, variables that have led to, um, you know, problems like a cruise ship getting infected, or like a hospital not following procedures, or even um, that precise timing of the outbreak in Wuhan, where uh, half the population apparently left for the holidays, and which might not have happened if there had been an outbreak several months earlier or whatever. So it's complicated. Okay. Uh, we, we Let's go to question and answer now, so we can be respectful of the one hour time for okay. this. Gotcha. Um, we do have somebody with a mic, um, so if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and she'll bring it over to you. Um, thank you for all of your um, perspectives on that. So uh, when I was under the quarantine, I was so paranoid of getting sick. You know, um, there was definitely a lot of with um, against Chinese people, but right now the virus is in the United States, and we have been talking about that from top down on like a macro level. If I get sick, like after spring break, after everyone comes back, like if there's virus, are we ready for that? Like or like, if I get sick, where should I go seek for help? Because I know in China there's such a huge crowd of people who are you know, like looking for help, they don't have places to go, they can only go get medicine and stay at home and hope for the best. Um, but, you know, in the United States, we, like, we need appointments for everything. So, yeah, in general, is the public health system in the States ready for this kind of virus? <laughs> um, so the CDC says, um, you know, wash your hands and practice good hygiene, and if you feel ill and have a fever, go see a medical professional. So, like you said, you might, you know, sometimes, and, and first of all, our health system varies in different parts of the country, but sometimes you have to wait for an appointment. But we do have emergency rooms, and in general, we have hospitals, you know, we, the, the CDC, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, um, less so things like FEMA or Homeland Security or things like that because we just don't have people right now. They haven't been uh, appointed into these roles. But you know, most hospitals are going to have um, CDC best practices. It's going to be there, and that's you know again that's what the CDC is telling you. Is that going to reassure us? No, because that that's the point. Is that this is it, it's it, they're saying it's inevitable that there are going to be outbreaks in different communities uh, moving forward. And so, you know, what hap how that disease progresses if all the Colby students go off for spring break and come back and some, you know, maybe a student or two or three are infected, how that's going to affect our community? We have no idea. We have no idea. And there may be localized cases like in Italy where maybe a hospital or a clinic might not follow uh, proper uh, protocols. But Gail, yeah, could you talk a little bit about, I've, I've read some things about some of the cases are so mild, people aren't really realizing about it. Yes, so there's, that, is that true? there's a couple of important things here. One is that the disease, can, the infection, can manifest itself in three ways. And I would say there's maybe one example of the fourth way, which is that there's, there, the person's asymptomatic. But that's almost not the case. Either there's a very, a mild, very mild illness, or you might have a little bit of fever or whatever, or there's non-life-threatening pneumonia. And then the deaths occur with severe pneumonia accompanied by what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And in the case of this particular virus, it tends to be affecting older people. Um, other viri can affect actually younger people, it depends. Um, so the, you know, there, there's that, that people may actually be infected and have it and not even know if they're not getting tested because, and you know, you have to do uh, some sort of genetic testing, you know, to determine for sure that you're infected with this particular coronavirus. Um, the other thing is that your um, another reason why cases might get missed is because of the fact that we do have this very very high background level of influenza, um, and you know the, the case fatality rate is a lot lower for you know influenza this year, but we've got you know 29 million cases or whatever so far. So seeing a seeing a, a spike of coronavirus you know above a background is difficult. 
um, you know, to detect. So there are several reasons why. And that's why some people are actually saying, like, a, a lot more people have been infected than we know, or than, than we will know. Yeah. And I don't know if that's really going to be true. But I mean, I can also maybe to reassure you, with, when Ebola happened, uh, Maine General, I know, had a plan um, for exactly what would happen. It, I know this because I got a call from an administrator here who said, you know, we've, we've talked with Maine General and kind of determined that if there's an Ebola case in Central Maine, it's probably because of us, right? It's probably because of college. And I said, you mean it's probably because of me and my students, right? I did have a student in Liberia that summer uh, who thankfully was fine. But, um, you know, they had worked out a whole protocol from moment of suspecting a case to isolation, all that stuff. And I, I would, I, I'm sure, um, given that the CDC is pushing for this stuff, I'm sure every hospital system in this country is, is working on a plan right now if they don't already have one in place. And, and let me add, that's part of the, the CDC's push for their preparedness is making sure medical workers know what to look for because there are diagnostic kits that, again, I don't know if each state, I know that um, they've been sent out. I don't know how you get one. I suspect states have their own um, CDC type program, so they may get a kit which can treat like seven or 800 or, or test seven or 800 people. So, you know, those things and those tests are fairly rapid. Um, so they, you can get a result within 24 hours, but you got to know ahead of time. And again, the people you go see, if you go into the hospital, what are the symptoms, right? How long, you know, when did you first start feeling sick? Because the, what's the incubation time? This is, symptoms can show anywhere from two to 14 days after you've been infected. So knowing those types of numbers and knowing, okay, what's the quickest way we can do a, a polymerase, DNA amplification test, we can do a serum test, you know, there's different diagnostic, diagnostic tests and then can isolate because there's not, there, there's no medication, right? This is a viral disease. We don't have antibiotics. Antibiotics don't work on viruses, right? So we can't just say, oh, here, take some penicillin, you know, that'll help keep it down. The viruses, a lot of these, um, as, as well as some bacterial diseases, you have, they have to run their course, right? So they run their course, you hope that the immune system of that person can respond. And, you know, and that's generally what happens, is, is it's able to overcome the agent that's in the body. But, but in the, like these type three and type four cases, that's when the health is really needed, that's when you need help, ventilation, things like that. Um, so the sooner we can you know, test you beyond just the temperature measurement on your forehead, right? Do you actually have the particle number? We have the genome sequence information. We've had that for a while. We can respond more rapidly as long as the people are updated. And that's something we do, I think, we're doing here in the U.S. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there are two parts to my question. The first part being, because of their secrecy, to what degree do you think the Chinese government is culpable? And then it's culpable for the spread of coronavirus. And then the second part being as if the virus continues to spread at a high rate, do you think this merits international criticism on the secrecy of the Chinese government? That sounds like I should maybe try to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think as Gail mentioned, there's been amazing progress since 2002-03 with the SARS epidemic. I mean, um, the, the way the central government has mobilized around the coronavirus is impressive. Um, I mean, just think about uh, what they built, three hospitals in Wuhan in two weeks. Um, I've been watching this athletic center go up <laughs> for a couple of years, it feels like. But, um, I, yes, I think we can blame, uh, not Beijing perhaps, but what I'm trying to suggest is that um, there's a problem with, with uh, information being shared between local and, and central government and with citizens. Uh, it's very different this case than the SARS case. Um, in the SARS case, uh, journalists were arrested and detained uh, for reporting on it. Um, uh, citizen activists were jailed. Uh, this was a case where uh, this most recent coronavirus issue in, in Wuhan, where local government officials wanted to protect themselves. They were covering their butts. 
Um, so to make it about China, as though Beijing was responsible and it was culpable, and uh, I, you know, I think we can talk about um, information problems without engaging in some kind of um, exaggerated notion that China is a super secret, um, you know, malevolent state. I, I think that that's wrong um, or incorrect. Um, but I think there could be, you know, I think political scientists could be useful in um, crit critiquing more vocally the problem of decentralized authoritarianism and, and the implications of that, the kind of, you know, using principal agency theory and talking about um, how natural it is for information hoarding to result in a situation like that. I think, um, from what I read, actually Beijing didn't know a lot until at least a couple weeks into it. So it was, it was the information stayed regional right. um, with, with potentially significant implications. The other clarification I just want to make is that the World Health Organization, based on this um, on the ground work that they concluded yesterday in China, has uh, concluded that the epidemic has peaked as, in China. And that means that the incidence is going down. And so they're calling it plateaued at this point. So it's possible that, that we won't see a significant um, you know, increased spread of the disease in China, at least in this moment in time. But a lot of people are also saying, as Susan said, that um, you know, this, this coronavirus is likely here to stay. So. Can I just ask it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Hatch, can you speak towards um, China's mass surveillance system and trying to contain the virus? Then they're kind of watching people through technology in their phones and tracking them. Has that played a part, do you know, or is it? getting a boost from the people, are they becoming more open to being surveilled all the time? That's a really interesting question. So people know that China is perfecting face recognition technology. And, uh, there's something like 200 million cameras that have been installed in cities around the country. Um, and even in villages, so it's also in the countryside. Um, but Meredith is the question is this a useful way to find out about um, the movement of people? You know, ironically, it might be. Um, I'm not a big fan of mass surveillance of citizens, but um, I would imagine that it's useful information on where people are going. Um, they have so much information uh, through this advanced facial rec recognition software. Um, I can only imagine that they're able to track the movements of people. I just, I Did you see any of the viral videos of like the drones and speaker systems? So they were like going out and finding people who were out and about without their masks. Mm. And, and, and you know, a voice starts saying to you, uncle, why are you out here? You're not, you're supposed to be at home. Right. Everybody's under quarantine. Or auntie, why aren't you wearing your mask while you're going to the market? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of creepy. It's very creepy, but also, as a public health measure, you're tracking down the senior adults who aren't following the recommendations who are at the highest risk of dying from this thing. Yeah. What's the trade-off there?